Firefly's Blue Ghost 1 lands safely on the moon. Athena doesn't. NASA shuts down more instruments on the Voyagers. Starship explodes again. And in the free Patreon edition, how Vera Rubin could find another flyby target for New Horizons. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Buckle up, it's a big week in space news. So first, we're gonna give you some really good news. And that is that Firefly Aerospace's Blue Ghost 1 lander successfully landed on the moon. And this became the first ever private lander to land on the moon in the orientation and the direction that it was hoping and planning to do. Now, Blue Ghost is part of NASA's commercial litter payloads program, and this is where they are not paying for the lander, they're just paying for the ride to the moon. And so Blue Ghost delivered all of its 10 instruments down to the surface of the moon. They're gonna do a bunch of tests. One is some test materials where they wanna find out whether or not the lunar regolith is going to stick to it, whether it's gonna be repelled by it. It's got another retroreflector so that people can do more accurate measurements of the distance to the moon. It's got a drill that's gonna drill down three meters into the regolith to try and find out how heat is being transferred from the inside of the moon to its exterior. It's got a digital vault containing so much of humanity's art and literature and media. It's got an electromagnetic dust shield to try and repel this clingy lunar regolith. And then a bunch of other instruments to try and sample the conditions on the surface of the moon. And we've already seen Blue Ghost test one of its instruments, the Planet Vac. It's a way to sample regolith, but really it's vacuuming up that filthy, filthy moon. And as with many of the lunar landers, it's designed to work during the lunar day. And so it landed last week. It's got 14 days of operation on the surface of the moon before the lunar night comes in. It's expected to last about seven hours into the lunar night, but then the temperatures will plunge and it will also die. So congratulations to everybody on the Firefly Aerospace team. And yet, just before we were recording this episode of Space Bites, we got the Intuitive Machine's second lander, Athena, attempting its landing on the moon. Now. Before we talk about what happened with Athena, let's go back and look at what happened with the previous lander, Odysseus, about a year ago. It made its landing attempt on the moon, it had a problem with its laser rangefinder, came down hard on the surface of the moon, broke one of its legs, and fell over sideways. And unfortunately, its antenna wasn't pointed towards the Earth, it wasn't getting a lot of power into its system, so it was able to send just like a brief message, and then it went offline. And so Athena is the learning lessons for what happened with Odysseus. And Athena made its lunar landing attempt on Thursday, and we got confirmation that it was making its way down to the surface of the moon. So the lander touched down, but also its main engine was still going. It was still sending telemetry information. And, and then once it landed, it wasn't generating enough power in its solar panels. And that could be because it wasn't facing the sun that it had fallen over again. And then officials from Intuitive Machines did a press conference shortly after and said that from what they could tell, they believed that it wasn't in the correct attitude on the surface of the moon yet again. In other words, it fell over again. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, this is very early days. This just happened from when we are recording this episode of Space Bites, and we're, we'll find a lot more information by next week. But, you know, if it turns out that it fell over again and had a very similar problem, then this means there's like some deep issue that they weren't able to sort out with the first one to the second one. So we'll keep you posted on what happened. Future Fraser here. Uh, we did get confirmation that Athena did fall over onto its side. And you can see in this picture, two of its legs are in the air. So that's not good. And then last week, we talked about the rideshare that was carrying Odysseus to the moon, that there was a bunch of other payloads on board. One of these was Odin, which was created by Astroforge. It's going to be an asteroid mining satellite. As soon as it separated from the rideshare, the mission controllers were expecting that the spacecraft would boot up, it would communicate with them, and it didn't happen. And so then they've been watching for several days and they haven't received any signal. And so now like best chance to be able to communicate with the spacecraft has is over. And so it's almost certain that they won't maintain contact with it. And then another satellite on that rideshare, the NASA's Lunar Trailblazer was 
also lost. Now, NASA was able to communicate with it, but from what they can tell, it's just spinning in a very low power state, not able to maintain, so it's not able to bring energy into its solar panels. And what was supposed to happen was that it needed to be in the right trajectory, make a bunch of course corrections so it could go into the special polar orbit that it was going to be doing around the moon. And because that didn't happen, but they still have contact with it, the hope is that they can get it to correct itself and they can put it into a different lunar orbit. But the window for that is also starting to close. And if it gets too far away and they're not able to make those course corrections in time, then it will fly away from the moon and into solar orbit. All right, that's enough lunar mission news. Let's move on to Venus. So as I'm sure you probably know, there's a bunch of spacecraft that are going to Venus. There's Veritas, there's Da Vinci Plus, and there's a mission from the European Space Agency. But also there's a private Venus mission that's in the works. It's mostly being funded by Rocket Lab. They're a launch provider, but it's also being designed at MIT. And so we got some really cool pictures this week of engineers at NASA that are helping to build the aeroshell that is gonna go around the mission when it goes to Venus. It's expected to launch in 2026 on a Rocket Lab Neutron, and that is their next generation rocket system. And this is kind of an advertisement that they have this capability now. But the mission's going to arrive at Venus in 2027. It's going to plunge into the atmosphere, and then it's going to look through a window and fire a laser into the atmosphere of Venus, and then look at how the laser light is scattering as it's moving through the atmosphere. And depending on the kinds of molecules that are in the atmosphere when the laser fires, they'll be able to see that in how the laser light is scattered. And that will tell them if they're seeing organic molecules, what their size is, their composition, how dense they are. And that'll give a sense if the conditions for life are there in the cloud tops of Venus. And then it's gonna keep going, eventually be destroyed by the heat and pressure lower down on Venus. NASA shuts down some of the instruments on the Voyagers. Even though it's been almost 50 years, the Voyager spacecraft are still going. 47 years now? But the problem is that they are running lower and lower on power. Their method of getting electricity is they have a decaying chunk of plutonium on board called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, and that produces heat. And then with a thermocouple, they're able to extract electricity out of that heat. But over time, the plutonium decays, it gets less heat, provides less electricity to the spacecraft. Over the decades, NASA has had to make these compromises to the amount of power going to the different instruments on the Voyagers. And so every year or so, we talk about them shutting off another instrument. And we got the last shut down back in October. And we learned that they shut off another instrument in February called the Cosmic Ray Subsystem. And then in March, they're planning to shut off the low energy charged particle instrument. And so that leaves the Voyagers with just three instruments. NASA said that if they didn't make this change, they would have to shut down the spacecraft within a few months. So this allows them to get into the 2030s. And by the 2030s, they'll be down to just a single instrument on each of the spacecraft. And then eventually, there will come this day, I want you to be prepared for this emotionally, when they're gonna have to shut down that last instrument, and then shut down the Voyagers entirely. So so make your peace. Europa Clipper flies past Mars. NASA's Europa Clipper is on the way to Jupiter, but before it gets to Jupiter, it has to do a tour of the inner solar system. And so it just made a flyby of Mars coming in within 1000 kilometers of the surface of Mars. And it did this for two reasons. One is to actually slow itself down a little bit, but also to dramatically change its trajectory, essentially using the gravity of Mars as a slingshot to move it into a new direction. The next target, Earth. So it's gonna come back to Earth and do a flyby of planet Earth in 2026, where it's gonna do a gravitational assist, it's gonna get a speed boost, and then it's gonna make its way out to Jupiter for 2030. And this is a great chance to do science, to test out the instruments on board Europa Clipper, to make sure that they're working both with Mars and then later on with Earth. And that gives them every chance to prepare for the upcoming flybys of Europa in 2030. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best news of the week. And the winner last week 
was the sun passing through the Orion Nebula. So thank you everybody who voted. We put the vote into the post tab within 24 hours of releasing this episode of Space Bites. So go there, choose the story that you thought was best this week, and then we will tell you next week what everybody thought. Of course, the best way to see that is to subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, and then just vote on a bunch of our stories to train the algorithm that you want to see more of this. It's partially cloudy on an ultra hot Neptune. So once again, we get a reminder that the solar system is not normal, that there are planets out there that are nothing like anything we have here in the solar system. For example, Consider the system LTT 9779b. This is classified as an ultra hot Neptune and they're very rare. So just like a hot Jupiter, you've got something that's about the size of Neptune that is orbiting its star extremely close. It takes about a day to complete a year. And so the temperature on one side reaches 2000 Celsius. And I say one side because the planet is almost certainly tidally locked to the star. But what's really strange is when astronomers were watching the planet as it was going around the star, they noticed this really peculiar behavior in its brightness that was changing that didn't match with the hemispheres of the planet compared to the star. And what they realized after they did enough observations, that on the day side, it's probably split with a giant arc of a very reflective cloud system on the western hemisphere. And then it's darker on the eastern hemisphere on the side that's facing the star and that these clouds are made of probably silicate. So there's like glass clouds, sand glass clouds on one side of the hemisphere that is facing the star as it's going around. And then there's some really complicated heat redistribution that's going where you've got heat from the front side moving around to the back side to redistribute fast winds, weird clouds, strange planet, whatever dark matter is or isn't, it doesn't decay. So we still don't know what dark matter is, it could be that we don't understand the force of gravity at the larger scales, it could be there's some kind of slow moving, massive particle that doesn't interact with light or itself or particles. One theory is that it's this particle called an axion. And if it is an axion, then it should decay on some regular rate and by decaying release some heat out into the universe like other particles of decay. So astronomers came up with a really clever experiment to see if they could observe excess heat in the infrared coming from decaying dark matter. So they looked at two dwarf galaxies and then gathered all of the light in the infrared spectrum. They were able to split up that light and get rid of the obvious sources, our own atmosphere, as well as uh, dust in the intervening area and other sources of infrared radiation. And then they were looking for a specific signature of radiation in that light. And in the total amount of infrared radiation that they saw, they were able to account for all of it, which means there was no excess infrared radiation coming from decaying dark matter. And so based on the accuracy that they got, they were able to confidently say that whatever dark matter is, it doesn't decay within a one followed by 27 zeros, 10 octillion years before dark matter decays or longer. So whatever dark matter is, doesn't seem to decay. Chandra finds a smashed planet. So this is the Helix Nebula. And it is one of the largest, most famous planetary nebula that we have in the sky. This is what happens when a star like our sun dies, it puffs off its outer layers, and you get this really cool structure of material around it. And then it leaves behind a white dwarf, which is the burned out core of the star. And then that slowly cools down to the background temperature of the universe. And astronomers have had a mystery about the Helix Nebula of White Dwarf for a long time, which is that it occasionally flashes in X ray radiation. And that's not something that commonly happens with white dwarfs. You see that with neutron stars, with black holes, but not with white dwarfs. One hint is that astronomers have already found a giant planet in orbit around this white dwarf. And so now they think that these occasional flashes of radiation are coming from a planet that is closer in to the star that had been destroyed and bits and pieces of it are falling down onto the white dwarf and releasing flashes of radiation occasionally in the x rays. Next, we've got to look at a really cool video of a capsule re entering the atmosphere. And normally when a spacecraft enters the Earth's atmosphere, it goes through a point where it's completely covered in plasma and it's almost impossible 
to communicate with it. And so often these are sort of the scariest times during the Apollo missions when the astronauts were coming back from orbit, and you didn't know that they were safe or not. Now, this has gotten better Starship, we've been able to watch the entire landing even through that point where they're getting a lot of that interference. But we got a really cool video from a company called Varda Space. And this is their W2 capsule, they launched it about six weeks ago, it spent weeks in orbit, and then it returned to Earth. And it was carrying a bunch of payloads for NASA, the military, other commercial partners who want to be able to test products in space and then bring them back down to Earth. And so it was recording its reentry for the entire time. And so you see as it passes into the atmosphere, you can see the gases and plasma build up around the capsule, and then it lands in the Australian outback. And so it's great to be able to see that process from orbit to landing. And this is actually the second time they've done this. And we've seen a previous video that showed a very similar experience. Starship explodes again. So at the time that we're recording this episode of Space Bites, we actually paused to watch the launch of Starship. And then we were going to get ready to complete the rest of the recording when Starship was re entering the Earth's atmosphere for its eighth flight test. But it turns out we didn't have to wait for the second part. So, in case you haven't already seen, Starship and Super Heavy were tested for the eighth time on Thursday. We saw a picture perfect launch, beautiful clear skies. We could see the rocket, hear the noise and it was able to do its separation that all went fine. The super heavy booster returned back to Boca Chica landed was caught safely by Mechazilla, and then Starship headed off to orbit. And last time with flight seven, within a couple of minutes of that ascent burn, the spacecraft went offline and people reported seeing chunks flying through the air uh, further down range. So this time the hope was that it would be able to continue up to orbit and it was going to do a test testing out some dummy Starlink satellites and then re enter the atmosphere and safely land in the Indian Ocean like it had with previous missions, but it started to tumble. And so I guess with the previous one, we just learned that it had tumbled. This time we got to watch it happen, which was kind of unnerving as you watched Starship tumble around. And then they lost contact, it must have torn itself apart. And again, I'm sure we'll see video from people downrange who see the debris flying through the atmosphere. So that was flight eight, hopefully flight nine will make it to orbit. Now you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, and I am writing my weekly email newsletter, The Guide to Space, where we cover so many more stories about space and astronomy that we'll have time to talk about here on the show. For example, Artemis astronauts might put an interferometer on the moon. Hubble finds its first Kuiper Belt duo and a planetary disk that refuses to grow up. My newsletter comes out every Friday to 70,000 of my closest friends. It's completely free. There's no ads and you can sign up, go to universe today.com slash newsletter. Did you know you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus story over on Patreon completely for free. This week's bonus story is all about how Vera Rubin could find a new target for New Horizons. I'll put a link in the show notes. I'm going to talk about an announcement for a big announcement. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. A special thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Sean Sargent, Spidersoft.io, Stephen Fowler Munley, Thomas L. Skadron, and Vlad Chaplin who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So next week, we're going to make an announcement about the future of universe today. And it is going to be pretty dramatic and a pretty big change from the way we're doing things up until this point in the 25 years of my history of being a space journalist and being the publisher of Universe Today and the very future of Universe Today, the very future of me, the very future of our entire team, and really space journalism in general will depend on it. And so stay tuned for that next week. All right, we'll see you then.